This episode is brought to you by Stars. Lisa Tadeo's best selling book is about to become your favorite new show. Based on a true story, the new Stars original series, Three Women, stars Shailene Woodley as Gia, a grieving and struggling writer who embarks on a cross country road trip where she meets three women determined to radically change their lives. This one is not to be missed. Watch the season premiere of Three Women now, only on Stars and the Stars app. With Walmart's new Fresh and Frozen subscriptions, you can save time on your weekly grocery shopping. Dad, you're supposed to be grocery shopping. And miss the chance to embarrass you in front of your friends? <laughs> I subscribe to snacks and wet napkins. You know how messy you are. Dad! Walmart. Subscribe to your weekly list. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and today I am once again joined by my very best friend in the whole entire world, Dr. Emma. <laughs> Rebecca, how are you? Your introduction just keeps getting longer and longer, doesn't it? <laughs> I love them. I love them. Thank you very much for having me back. Well, I guess, you know, we did tease people with what we were going to do next. So, and the response has been great to that previous episode. I want to thank everyone who's made comments on, on both the, the two episodes of, that we talked about in that one, the, the previous one with the quality in art, and then the one about the role that Catherine of Aragon played recruiting all the leading Renaissance artists that we talked about, because everyone was a leading uh, Renaissance artist. Uh, she even had people uh, like involved like Torrigiano, Hans Holbein. And then at the end, we were teasing about someone else, right? Remember we, that, Rebecca? We were. So let's start with that. So today we're going to talk okay. about, and I'm, we're going to talk about her name too. So we're going to talk about Susanna Horenboot, or is it Horenbout? Which way are we supposed to pronounce her name? I don't even know. And, I, and I've studied this artist for many years because why? Because first of all, we see it written many ways. She appears in different sources. Sometimes she appears in German sources and then other times she appears in English sources. So Italian sources. So she's given different names and then women like Susanna. So we know her name was Susanna. Um, Susanna, that, that's for sure. Uh, I and mean, there's things that we're certain about, about her life, but in the case of her last name that comes from her father's name um we just simply don't don't know how they would pronounce it in in ghent where she was from uh probably Horenboot. uh but then in england it's spelled in different ways in the sources and those tend to be phonetically because i know mm. catherine of aragon did that she would write anton court and i mean hampton court she even had an accent right she wouldn't pronounce those h's like like sometimes spanish people do um with their h's in english so uh, i am in, in anton court right uh court like <laughs> it sounds very spanish to me when i when i read it out loud so this is the thing about her name but but we know that she was a daughter of a very famous uh illuminator from ghent called Gerard Hornboot, or about whatever we want to call him, and his wife, Margaret Zvanders. Mm. And we know also that this couple had six children, six children, and that Gerard was one of these artists that had a workshop where his children, at least three of them, trained, because Susanna was one of them. She was born uh, around 1503, 1504. We'll talk about why we know that. And then... Uh, Lucas was another one of the children of uh, Margaret and uh, Gerard. Uh, and they trained with, with Gerard in Ghent in the family workshop to become illuminators too. So he trained his daughter to be able to help him decorate manuscripts mm. and do all this very technical work because we have to think these are miniatures. These are very, very small pictures. Was that a big deal for the time that he trained his daughter in this? It is in in the global context of Europe. It's 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 starting to become more and more prominent in the Netherlands. Okay. It's a it's a, a thing that happens mostly in the Netherlands and will happen in Italy too. So now we're thinking that we're talking about the same two places that we talked about with Alejandro Vergara about the places that were producing the best art in Europe, that these courts, these uh, princes of the Renaissance, like Catherine Aragon, Henry VIII, Francis I, Isabel of Castile, 
wanted this the, these arts that artists that were trained to do the best art right mm-hmm. why why would you want uh, uh someone trained like that to paint uh manuscripts for you to to decorate your choir books your uh, daily manuscripts that you used to pray religion and was uh, uh, something that they were in contact with not daily but at, at all times really so they were doing works um in these in these manuscripts but the the difference with this family is that in 1515 Gerard is appointed court painter to Margaret of Austria and valet de chambre which is a, a, a an official role in her household right so these painters become associated with Margaret of Austria who is the governor of this place called the Hasburg Netherlands she's ruling the Netherlands in the name of uh, Charles V, who is also the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. Now we see where the family connections come into place and how I found out about these guys in the first place, right? Yeah. So they are connected to Margaret of Austria since the 15, this is 1515 at least, uh, when he was, when Gerard was appointed. So Susanna was around 13, 14, when this happened, 15. The first glimpse that we catch of Susanna is probably the best because in May of 1521, Albert Dura, one of the leading Renaissance artists, <laughs> the German artist, a very famous artist for um, having a big role in disseminating Renaissance art through prints, um, and other and, and works that he did, woodcuts and things like that, designs that he did to spread um, these these um, images that were produced in a new style in, in courts. And he was selling his work around the Netherlands when he arrived to Antwerp. Antwerp was a port where all the luxurious items from uh, Flanders were were being taken to places like London. So Susanna wasn't when he when Dura meets Susanna and Gerard Harmboot in Antwerp. They're not really in their home, are they? Because they're from Ghent. W- what were they doing there? This is fifteen twenty one. It's very probable that they were doing some sort of work there to bring things to England, right? In other cases, we know that the daughters of these illuminators, like uh, one of Levina Turnlick's sisters, became art dealers. So was Susanna by this time an art dealer with her father, maybe? That was, you know, um, exporting things from the court of Margaret of Austria to to the court of Henry and Catherine, probably, because they migrate to England in the 1520s, and we know this. We know this because they start appearing in the English royal records and elsewhere, right? So um, this is when Jura finds uh, Gerard and Susanna, she has her work with her too, and she has examples to show him. And he sees one of her paintings, one of her miniatures. It, it's a it's a figure of Christ. It's a savior, he says. And he says, it is incredible that a woman can paint a work of this quality. And he buys it from her. So this is the, the moment when Susanna becomes really, I mean, when a guy with like, like Jura makes a comment like that about you, it's because most probably it's because he wanted to meet you for some reason, right? And we can talk about why Jura might have wanted to meet Susanna because he was recording what he was selling, what he was spending his money with and the people he was meeting there because what he was going there to do was to learn about the work of the illuminators in the Netherlands. So he wanted to meet Susanna. Why? Mm-hmm. Because she was already in the service of Margaret of Austria through her father and most probably already in the service of Catherine of Aragon, because just months prior to that, to that encounter between Dura and Susanna, the Venetian ambassador in the Tudor court is reporting from Calais after the Field of Cloth of Gold, right? Let's just mention what the Field of Cloth of Gold was, in case somebody doesn't know, was a a diplomatic encounter between the, the court of Henry VIII and the court of Francis I in France. So Catherine of Aragon went, Cardinal Wilsey was there. It was a way to show to the world that they were magnificent princes, but also that they were starting to have an understanding in certain things, and they wanted to show publicly that they were allies, let's say, um, 
and I use the air quotes for people who are not, because really they wanted to see each other and compete and see who was the yeah. most annoying uh, European monarch of the time. Um, <laughs> who do you think won, Rebecca? <laughs> Yeah, it was well, a we, tie. It was a tie. Yeah, it was a tie. <laughs> so <laughs> most annoying tie. After Francis and and Henry tied being the most annoying monarch in in Europe in the field of cloth of gold, what is not as commonly known is that France uh, that Henry and Catherine also met with Charles V in Cal- in Calais, and that they traveled into the Netherlands. And met with Margaret of Austria, with Ferdinand of Habsburg, who would become emperor later on, and uh, and Catherine's nieces, Catherine of Austria, Isabel of Austria. Uh, there were many people in the court of Margaret of Austria because, for example, Christ, uh, Christian the Second of Denmark uh, was there. Uh, there was just it was a, it was the court where the horn boots were producing this art, right? Um, and in the farewell ceremony, what the Venetian ambassador tells us is that when Charles was leaving, a woman gave him a portrait and he rewarded her with a very expensive gold chain. Thirteen years later, Charles would do the same with Titian and Titian painted himself wearing this chain because he was this access to the noble rank. Well, the first time we hear about Susanna Horenboot in England is in 1529, and she it's in her mother's tomb, and she most probably commissioned this, this brass that it was to commemorate her mother's death. She is, her name there in the inscription is Dame Susanna. So she was part of the English gentry. Well, she's most probably this woman that was in Galais and that gave Charles V a portrait and was rewarded with a gold chain. She was already Catherine of Aragon's portrait painter through the connection with Margaret of Austria, like she had done before with Pietro Torrigiano mm. for the marriage between Charles and Mary Rose Tudor. This time, Catherine had recruited Susanna and the rest of the Horan Boots, who would go on to serve Mary Tudor in the household that was set up for her in 1525. Okay. Where Susanna is first mentioned as Mrs. Parker because she married she married twice in England, um, and her first husband was John Parker. Was Mr. Parker made a knight? Is that how she became a dame, or was it in her own right that she became dame? Do you know? Well, in the household of Mary Tudor in 1525, she's Mrs. Parker, which means she is there because of her husband's role. He, he John Parker became keeper of the robes and of the Palace of Westminster. Oh, wow. Yes. So, and my argument is that Susanna became a portraitist. Well, w- what better than marry her to the guy in charge of the of the clothes? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point. And we'll talk about why that is very, very, very important, really. that That is key to the whole, to understand, because the problem with the Susanna Harnwood is we, she doesn't appear in the royal accounts like her, like her brother does. Right. Her brother is made King's painter in 1525. So that means the same year that he sent with Mary Tudor, too. But Susanna doesn't have an official appointment. Why don't we know about these things? Because all these things would have been in the Queen's privy purse expenses and all those sources linked to Catherine of Aragon that were destroyed by Henry VIII. Of course. And that's why we have to grab snippets of... Susanna's life from other sources, like the fact that she was mentioned by other people writing about the leading Renaissance artists of their time, like an Italian that 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 was that did an overview of of the art in the Netherlands, mentioning her as the leading woman artist of her time in the Netherlands because she was she had this extraordinary capacity to render very very good miniature images. So, and he says, so she was recruited by Henry VIII of England. He mentions Henry VIII, but it was Henry VIII through his wife's networks, through Catherine of Aragon's alliance with Margaret of Austria, who was Susanna's face, first patron, really, um, when she was working with her father. So this is all connected to the marriages established by Catherine of Aragon in England. First for, for Henry VIII's sister, 
and then for her own daughter when she wants to marry Charles to her own daughter. So the first uh, miniature portraits that were rendered in England were rendered by the Buharabu, so it's someone. Um, so they've always been attributed to Lucas because he was the one who established, was able to establish a workshop in London. Susanna couldn't do that because she was a woman. Okay, I feel like we need to backtrack a little bit. Is it possible that because of the field of cloth of gold and Henry VIII and Francis I having a small falling out there, that he went and had this meeting with Charles is is that possibly where the connection to Susanna starts? This is, the, the connection seems to start much, much earlier. Oh, it does. Um, Charles had been to England before the Field of Cloth of Gold because Catherine called him saying, Henry, is going, we're going to meet with Francis and you're doing nothing. You need to come to England. You need to remind him we're allies. And Charles arrives and talks to Henry. That's right. So, and they agree that this is going to happen. So basically there's a second field of cloth of gold that nobody knows about it hasn't been written about because when Henry and, and, and Catherine are in Calais they go into Gravelines for several days to meet with Margaret of Austria this is when she meets Susanna because she's working there for Margaret of Austria <laughs> at least but Susanna was most probably already in her service because the, the portrait exchanges between uh, Margaret of Austria and um, Catherine of Aragon and Gerard Horenboot could have painted the portrait of Mary Rose. He could have been that painter that Margaret sent in 1514. We just don't know because the ambassador doesn't give us his name. But Gerard Horenboot painted uh, pictures of royalty. We know because in 1522, Margaret paid him for a picture of Christian II of Denmark that he had painted. So this is all connected to portrait exchanges and art to represent these allies because you want pictures to consolidate those alliances in your own court. If you have a picture of Charles, it's more likely that you can talk to Henry about the alliance in front of him. It's like, look at him. My, my nephew, isn't he great? He's Holy Roman Emperor. He's the King of Spain. And in the case of the portrait that Mary Rose had of Charles that has survived and is today in the Royal Collection, he's holding a branch of a rosemary branch. And you know why he's holding that? Because that's the, the symbol associated with Aphrodite. So it's basically Charles saying to Mary, we're going to make lots of babies when we you know, get married. It's true. <laughs> I love the symbolism in portraits. I love when you yeah. tell us about these And she things. carries this portrait everywhere with her. So <laughs> She is constantly reminded. She's gonna, like, this is going to be my husband. We're going to make lots of babies. <laughs> with large chins. <laughs> and Catherine was like, you know what the rosemary means, right? Because she would explain these things to Mary Rose yeah. because she had a, a education that Mary Rose never got. So Mary Rose and, 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 and Catherine were close friends, became close friends because Catherine had this knowledge and and brought these things, these amazing things, like the portrait of Charles V to Mary and, and a necklace that her mother had had owned. Um uh she gave that to me. She gave many of the jewels that she brought from Spain to Mary when she was going to get married to Charles. Oh, but I didn't know Mary, that. But yes, but then she didn't marry Charles because Chan Chan Chan, Henry the Eighth got in the way, of course. And he married his sister to a dying Louis XII of France. And she goes to France with Charles Brandon. That's and what right. Else? Yeah, yeah. And let's, she, let's... Does, she comes back married, doesn't she? <laughs> but not with the king of France, right? <laughs> Yeah, it seems like things worked out in her favor that way, didn't they? Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Depends on this, how you feel about this Charles part, This part was my favorite part in the Tudors, in the in the <laughs> TV show. I was just going to say, she did not marry the King of Portugal, like they show in the oh, show. Oh, well, I mean, did you see that court? <laughs> that sh that it was, I mean, that, that sometimes, sometimes that to someone who works on, on, artistic and cultural exchanges between um, Southern Europe and Northern Europe. And is that sometimes these shows do have depictions that are wrong about courts that they, I don't know if they're trying to present them as exotic, but they come across as creepy. Yeah. 
So, you know, uh, that was that, that, that should be uh, taken care of a bit better, I think. Cultural awareness mm-hmm. is important, I think, when you're talking about people in foreign lands. Right. You don't have to change the actual history. I feel like so often, especially in that the Tudors, uh-huh. they changed history to make it easier for the American under um, the American audience to understand who was who. So they didn't want to confuse Francis the first with Louis because right. we're not smart enough to figure out that they were two dif- right. different people who ruled right. a different. They called her Margaret in the show instead of Mary because. Goodness, how could we keep all the Marys apart? (laughs) With Walmart's new Fresh and Frozen subscriptions, you can save time on your weekly grocery shopping. Dad, you're supposed to be grocery shopping. And miss the chance to embarrass you in front of your friends? (laughs) I subscribe to snacks and wet napkins. You know how messy you are. Dad! Walmart, subscribe to your weekly list. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride or die stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Well, yes, but then, I, yeah. But then, to, and the the problem is, I think, well, first of all, that's misleading. So why change the name of someone if they lived and you, you're trying to show like a historical events. But then uh, I think it's also annoying to the people who know about it because they're like, well, why is she Margaret now? And then yeah. you get confused because uh, Margaret, but she was, went to Scotland. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. you know? So, yeah, 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 yeah. But definitely we know who Mary Rose is. Uh, she had... This is what I don't see a lot in these shows is Catherine's connections to these women that are, you know, she makes, uh, she transforms Mary Rose into a, an appealing bride for a European context. Cause she's going to marry Charles V, future Charles V. He's not Charles V at this moment, but he's the Prince of Castile. He's the heir to Isabella and Juana and to, um, and to Fer- Fernando of Aragon too. And then he, in 1519, he's elected Holy Roman Emperor. So when Susanna Horenboot presumably gave him his portrait in 1520, when they were, when she was only, uh, well, we know that when she met Jura, Jura said she was 18. So she would have been given this chain at 17. Oh, wow. By Charles, who was only 20. There's a surviving miniature portrait of Charles in the Victoria Museum. That's most likely this painting that Susanna rendered and gave to him in 1520. And it's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful image of Charles. And it is based on the portrait that Mary Rose, that Mary Rose had of Charles V that is also in the Royal Collection in in Britain. So Susanna was probably this portrait that she painted, this miniature that she painted of Charles was a test to test her virtuosity, to see if she could paint, using this portrait, paint a, a miniature of Charles, but make him look better. Because the ambassador said he was not, didn't look very good in the previous one. And Susanna painted a beautiful miniature of Charles V that survives. And that was most recently in the Six Lives exhibition, alongside the miniature portrait of Mary, Princess Mary, wearing a little jewel that reads the emperor. So these were most probably painted by Susanna. That's, that's what this whole, this little snippet of a woman receiving a portrait in 1520 has led me to Rebecca. What do you think about this? My mind is just racing with all this information that you're giving me. Sorry. (laughs) My mind is racing too, guys. Sorry about that. I hope everybody's mind is not racing. I think think I'll have to explain it a bit more uh, some other time again so we can all or just take back and listen to it again. Um, But it's, these snippets are connected. But the snippets that Alejandro Vergara was telling me to to find and then connect to artistic changes tell a story. And it's Susanna Horenboot's story. 
And she was praised by Vasari, so she was very famous in her time. Why is she only briefly mentioned in today's manuals and always with her brother and father? It's because her brother and father appear in the English royal records, while she appears very, very extraordinarily like when she became a diplomat. Did you know that? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so Susanna was in charge of going to go and get Anne of Cleves. Oh, she was part of that whole retinue that went to go. She was part. She went there and she became the head of her household, too. What? She taught. Yes. And she taught Anne how to play cards. And she was her cultural ambassadress in the Tudor court. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then she's mentioned again in a critical, critical moment for all this um, theory that I'm presenting to you uh, based on my snippets. That is, um, in 1544, Susanna is mentioned in Mary Tudor's future Mary I, her privy purse expenses. We have a series of accounts that Mary kept herself from 1536 onward when she came back to court as Lady Mary. In 1544, Mary commissioned a portrait of herself and she paid for it. And there are payments for the jewels that she's wearing over the months before the payment for the, for the, for the portrait. But there's also a mention to Susanna. So the painting, do you see the, uh, my, yeah. <laughs> if you're not so watching the, this, we like... know, we know. <laughs> oh, nice, nice nails, by the way. Yeah. Becca has very nice red nails. Thank you. Um, so what this means is that when Mary was paying a uh, certain John is what it says in her privy purse expenses uh, for for who drew her face on on a on a table mm. and he was when she was paying for that it was one of the it was one of the parts of the commission of the portrait it was not the whole portrait because she also paid someone else to draw sleeves. She also paid to have her clothes ready, her jewels, and she gave Susanna black satin. So does this mean that Susanna was re-entering her service? Because when she is mentioned in, in her household in 1525, she was given black clothing. That's the clothing that people wore in Mary Tudor's um, household. Was she coming back to her service? Did she paint the portrait? The portrait survives in the National Portrait Gallery. It's, it was also in the Six Lives exhibition. And it has an inscription on it that says that this is Lady Mary, the daughter to um, Henry VIII. So it's at the age of 28. It's, it's, and it says it's this, year, it's this year. This was the year that Mary was becoming a very important person in Henry VIII's court again because uh, her new lodgings were finalized in, for example, in Whitehall. Was this painting for these new lodgings? Or was it to go in that dynastic gallery of portraits that her mother had um, had brought from the court of Margaret of Austria and had with Henry VIII? What did do you, you think? Did you say this was 1544? Mm -hmm. So Catherine Parr was queen. Do you think there's, right. there's some association? With... Oh, there is so much oh, association yay. there. <laughs> so the only other portrait... Um, the only other portrait attributed to this artist called Master John that is mentioned in Mary's uh, privy purse expenses and this painting that we have in National Portrait Gallery is the first surviving full-length portrait of a Queen of England, Catherine Parr, also in the Six Lives exhibition. And why is it attributed to this artist? Because it's very similar to the one of Mary. And we know that Catherine Parr became a patron of Susanna Hornwood and the Hornwoods, too. And we know that, and there's there's more work that needs to be done on how really Catherine Parr gets to Henry, and it's probably we know through Mary, right? Through through his daughter, and the association with his daughter is very close. Um, also, Catherine Parr had received miniature portraits of Henry and Catherine in 1529 when her mother died. Oh. Who were the painters who could do those pictures in 1529? Oh, I don't, I don't. Susanna. So, Susanna <laughs> and or her father or her brother. But most likely Susanna because all the evidence points to her as the one in charge of the portraits. 
because she was working to paint portraits for these marriages. And then when she became established in England, she was painting portraits of the, of the women in the royal house of Catherine Parr, Henry's new queen, of his daughter in, 15, in, in 1544. So this is very important also because there's another woman that arrives at the end of the reign of Henry VIII from Flanders, Lavina Turnick. Yeah. It's been, it's been, it's been argued that it's probably to substitute the aging Susanna because we know by the time Mary's queen, Susanna's died because her second husband marries, remarries. Lavina Turnick is also the daughter of one of these illuminators that was present in these manuscripts that Catherine Varagon saw in the court of Isabel of Castile. So there's a connection there. This is, again, connections between these women. The, it's, a, it's the women connected to the Spanish monarchy through marriage connections. But it's basically the Habsburgs in, the, in Flanders and Catherine of Aragon and then Mary I in England. And Levina becomes the person who, to conceptualize the image of, of the first female regnant, the female um, um, ruler in England, Mary I. And then that's copied by, in the time of Elizabeth II, uh, Elizabeth I. So it's basically... She constructs the image of, of the first woman to be a ruling queen in England because she creates images for these legal documents, the first legal documents that, that Mary ish, issues, um, the important ones, you know. I'm glad you brought up the timeline and who was first, Susanna or Lavina, because I think uh -huh. sometimes I confuse, I don't want to say I confused the two, but they were both miniature artists, right? So yes. it, I think it's easy to forget who came first. Well, they were trained as book illuminators, but in England they became portrait painters. Which is amazing. Because the their patrons had new necessities. They still did works in manuscripts. The Crampering manuscript in um, Westminster Abbey was most probably illuminated by Lavina Turnick, and it has pomegranates, and it's, it's for Mary, and Mary's depicted in, in this um, manuscript many times. So it's morphing. It's not not just religious uh, scenes where their patrons are featured as the person, the saint, or as uh, as Mary curing uh, uh, the scrofula. It's also images of them as 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 rulers to send to other people to start their own propaganda because it's very difficult for them because they're women in power. Yeah. Who better than a woman to understand a struggling woman? to do excellent work to help her in her project to become successfully to successful successfully rule England. You know, to, you have to take a tradition, you have to take that image that Henry VIII has created, which is a powerful image of, of power, and, and present yourself as the continuation, but as new, as as the mother of England, as Dr. Peter Stiffel mentions and says many times. And Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to know what Dr. Peter Stiffel thinks about all this episode when, when, when we're done. Mm -hmm. um, but um, this is basically uh, what I'm studying in, in relation to women artists in England. They are, they come uh, because uh, there is a need for the women who have this taste for high quality art um, executed in, in the Flemish style. They like it. They, are, they have new necessities. They have these, they want these little miniatures to send to people. And especially because uh, Henry VIII is, is starting to show that he's not very interested in having Catherine as his wife. So the first miniature portraits of Henry VIII that we have painted by Susanna, most probably, um, having scriptures of him with his name and that, and uh, there is at least one of Catherine Argo when it says that it's, it's the it's the pair to that uh, picture of Henry, and it, the, the inscription says that he that she is his wife, Uxor. So um, we have to remember that Henry sent his miniature to Anne Boleyn too. That was most probably painted by one of the Herm boots. So uh, Henry used these uh, images that Catherine created uh, also for his own purposes. But it was Catherine who brought these artists to the court. Um, it wasn't Henry. But in Basari, 
is, is Henry who gets all the credit. In the case of Levine and Turnick, Vasari does say that, she, that Mary I had a great esteem for her work. The problem is that Mary I's artistic patronage has not been studied because she's a very unpopular queen. Of course, right? Yeah. <laughs> is there, I, I'm, I'm curious if looking at portraits painted by Susanna, is there a way to know just by looking at them that she did them? Over the course of sitting what is probably her work for a long time, yes. And I'm going to try to explain what I just said, which sounded a bit weird when I said it. Okay. Uh, when you are sitting a certain... Uh, first of all, you have to identify all the Hornbook miniatures that were painted at Vivum, so from the life, uh, by a Horan boot in England to, to study that work of art and see what that tells you, right? Mm -hmm. But then when, when we relate that to other portraits that were painted in England, like the portrait of Mary Tudor in 1544, which is the first portrait that a woman in, of the royal house commissions herself and pays for herself, uh, it has similarities to the Horan boot miniatures because the background is is in the same very expensive pigment, as you write, uh, because it's got an inscription like the Hornburg miniatures. And then the model is, it's modeled after Holbein's pictures of Anne of Cleves and the other pictures that he painted of the wives of Henry VIII, of Jane Seymour. So we know that the Hornburgs had associations with Holbein. This is something that is mentioned in in places where the art of the time of Henry VIII is analyzed. So uh, they coincided in time at the court of Henry VIII. So they, they collaborated and Susanna went as a diplomat to get on at least, and then Holbein painted. I mean, the, the, there's connections between them. Yeah. Obviously, artists that arrive, like Holbein did in 1526, if the Horm, Horm boots were already there and we know they were already there, of course they're going to, Say, go and say hi to the other painters, you know? Yeah. Of course they collaborated in things. So, uh, yes, there's ways to know that an artist that you are studying might have painted that or was inspired to by certain things or or because it, it, it created that image in a certain way. And then you try, if if you have a lot of evidence of um, of someone's life and works, um, and you can play, paste those two together and they kind of lap over each other. You're like, oh, this could be the same person. So this is how I pieced all the little snippets of Susanna's, really not only her life, but her artistic milestones. Because she's not mentioned in the English records, we have to go to Basari, to Italians that talked about artists of the time. We have to go to the court of Margaret of Austria, and we have to go to her mother's tomb where she's mentioned and things like this, and know that she was Mrs. Parker, and know that she was Mrs. Gilman, and know that she, you know, all these things that you need to know. Or she is, and the unnamed woman in other occasions is more... There's more mentions to women in relation to the harem boots that we simply don't know because it's just a woman brought a manuscript. Of course, yeah. Because why would we talk about women? <laughs> why would you put names on them? Did she did she paint the manuscript? The illuminate. She brought a, a very 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 well illuminated manuscript. Okay, did she paint it? Did she just bring it for her brother? Who was it? Was it because, for example, Lucas harem boot married an English illuminator? Oh, yes. And she, Margaret Hosewither, was a daughter of a German goldsmith. So connections to the, to, to the empire, to Charles V again. These artists married each other in these networks, too. We know that from later on in the court, for example, of James I. This happens, too, with other artists. So these and, and, and let's remember, England and Flanders are very, very closely connected. They're not that far of each other, really. Right. So if Susanna was in Antwerp in 1521, and then she's mentioned in 1529 in, in, in England, and we know there's all these miniatures that are painted in the 1520s, and this and that, and all these pieces that I've talked about, we put that all together. 
And we can't know for a fact that she was that woman rewarded with this uh, chain in 1520, but she's the most likely candidate to be the woman who received that because of the other historical evidence. I love that you're telling us how they were all connected, because I don't know why I just seem to think all of these artists were such solo creatures. <laughs> oh, no, no, especially not in these work family workshops. There were family workshops. So Margaret Svanders, who is who is now buried in London, when you go to London next time and you do your tour, you will have to stop at Margaret Svanders' uh, tomb in All Saints Church in Fulham, where Susanna is mentioned as Dame Susanna. She's the only one of the children of Margaret and Gerard Harnboot, who had been court painted to Margaret of Austria, and mentioned in this brass that is deck is that it's, it's style is it's a Renaissance style. So did Susanna commission this? Did she design it? Mm. It's been proposed before. These are the kind of things that art historians need to think about when they find these snippets. What you need to understand very well is the artistic, historical context and cultural context to be able to form these theories from snippets of an artist's life or mentions in this in different sources in different languages and yeah it's 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 difficult but over the course of years you just realize things okay. maybe when you're taking a walk you realize you're like, right. why is she there? you yes. know yes and you I have mean, epiphanies that's the most important part of being a historian is mm -hmm. asking a lot of questions questions that other yes. people might not be asking and sometimes you have those moments where that question pops into your head when you're out for a walk or you're taking a shower or any reading a book or. <laughs> and another thing that I would recommend to anyone who wants to become a researcher is you never know where the information is coming from. Always listen, especially if you're listening about, you know, the topic you like, let's say in this case, the tutors, right? Yeah. Um, every occasion is an occasion to listen to what another person knows more about than you. And then reflect on what you know and say, ooh, because, you know, recently, uh, for example, on this very issue, we've talked about, you have, you've given me information about um, portraits that were exchanged, right? And, and mentioned um, in the case of your research. Right. Um, that's added to that to that pool of knowledge. Well, do you want to talk about that? Because that's a very interesting piece. Yeah, I think we're talking about the Catherine Parr thing, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so there is a letter between Thomas Seymour and Catherine Parr where Thomas asks Catherine for, I don't know if he said a miniature or a small portrait of yourself, something along those lines. Does he say an image or does he say a portrait? Ooh, I don't remember now off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look. But. Well, you've got some homework, Rebecca. They're usually <laughs> called images. Yeah, so I would, don't get surprised if you see it. It's just it's an image. An it image. Could, yeah. It could have just been an image that he said. Okay. And in her reply, Catherine said, uh, see, now you're putting me on the spot. She said that she would contact her paintress, right? Was that the term that she used? Oh, so she would contact her paintress. Yes. Guys, we'll have to look into this because this, imagine that, this is another snippet because sometimes we have little little um, snippets that are very interesting. Like the fact that when Labina Turnick is appointed court painter, she's called a paintrix, not a not the word used for the men usually. Um, so this is very interesting because um, it's basically, you know, they're close to the queens and they're painting them and imagine them. I can just imagine these sessions, you know, and Catherine arriving and being like, no, in this case, I'm going to wear a Spanish dress. <laughs> I'm going to send this to Claude uh, in France. I like Claude. I don't like Francis, but I like Claude. I like, I think Claude is nice. Uh, things like that, that she would talk mm -hmm. with Susanna when Susanna was going to paint her. Right. Cause uh, and then this this is very important because it all ties to really uh, an interest in, in England for miniatures. Think about Elizabeth I and all the images that Hilliard painted of her. Miniature portraiture becomes very important in, uh, for, for royals in, in England until the Victorian era. I mean, even nowadays, I just saw the news not long ago 
that um, Queen Camilla was given a, a miniature portrait of Charles III recently. Mm-hmm. So this is still a, the, these gifts of portraits. Why? Because if you're sitting home alone, you can take out your little portrait of whoever and you just have a little conversation, right? Right. And tell them about your day. And you want them pa- painted in a good way. You don't want them on their bad day. They have got, they've got a cold. You want them on that <laughs> glorious day. You were, you were in the countryside, you know, smiling at you wearing that, that, that um, shirt that you really like, you know, those things are the things that a patron like. So I encourage you to continue. Um, Exploring this snippet that you have. So go back and read the letter again, if you don't mind, and and tell me more about it. Yeah, definitely. You know, I love to talk about this stuff with you, too. And when I saw that in the letter, you were the first person I reached out to because I thought, whoa, this just grabbed my attention. I never noticed that one specific part in the letter. I just knew he was asking her to send him one so that he could look upon it and feel happy or something like that. I don't I should this have is, this. Yeah, this is what collaborating with other research does too. That that you never, and this is what we were talking in that other episode. When you when you read the book about what what is quality in art, you don't look at the sources or the books that you read in the same light. So you are thinking about things, and when you know someone who's studying portraits, and there's a mention to, I mean, imagine how many people contact me sending me stuff about Catherine Aragon. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not enough people. Come on. I need more stuff. <laughs> There's more stuff out there and we all need to find it because I mean, it's only, it's only the proportion will only get bigger of what, well, essentially we know is that women were tremendously involved in art innovation. And now in the 16th century, not only fr- from the elites, uh, from the ruling elites, the royals, but also these women that were certain have artistic careers. Lavina Turnick is the first woman to be appointed court painter in the European history when Henry VIII is almost dying. Do you think it was Henry VIII who really got her there? It was it was Catherine Parr and Mary Tudor. It was it was it was oh you know Susanna is getting old. Henry, look at him, he can't even move. Never mind him. Um <laughs> we need a new paintrix to paint our portraits because we are the important people now because Edward is pretty young. Yeah. We're going to take care of Edward, right? Right. Um, and and, and Lavina painted portraits of Edward, um, Catherine Parr and Mary Tudor. And so this is what I'm saying. Why is it women that Mary Tudor and Catherine Aragon prefer as portrait painters? Because they have a special way to render portraits a female way, you could say a, a female perspective, right? Yeah. So it's very interesting. And you know why? And maybe, I don't know how we're doing on time, but. No, <laughs> no, just know? keep going, keep going. Reckon I was going to give me a little cue when, when I, I was talking too long, but she hasn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go guys. I'm just gonna go. Um, this is very interesting because. When Lavina works for Mary, and we have evidence that she painted like she gifted her in the Christmas of 1556, she gifted her a picture of the Trinity, for example, right? And there's mentions to pictures in those New Year's gifts that were given to Mary the First of England. People knew she liked paintings. Also, we talked about the fact that she marries Philip II of Spain, and he brings artists and artworks, and artworks come because he's involved with her and married to her, right? Well, when Mary dies, Philip goes back to Spain. And who does he marry? He marries Elizabeth of Valois. And what does he do? He recruits a woman painter from Italy called Sophonis Languisola, who paints pictures of the royal family. Was this because Philip was influenced by Mary Tudor and her relationship with Livina Turnick that Vasari mentions? Probably. And Sophonis Languisola painted the most iconic portrait of Philip II of Spain because of this special way of rendering things with a female perspective. So this is what studying these first Flemish women artists in England, because they're very early on in the Renaissance, is leading you to when you also study your Texas exchanges with a place like the, the Spanish monarchy, right? 
these types of questions? <laughs> this has been a crazy episode. I feel oh, like I'm sorry, I, was it bad? No, it wasn't bad. I I love when we have these conversations because it's so mind opening. I think there's okay. so much I end up. Like, I was just worried when you said that. It, you got me worried for a second there. No, <laughs> I know. No, no, no. I think it was really good because I there's so much about the art world that I don't understand. And when you come on the show, you, I say this all the time, are such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this stuff that I just try to be a sponge and just absorb it all. So if you don't hear me talk very much is because I'm just over here soaking up everything that Emma is saying and trying to remember it all. Like I'm going to have to watch this episode back three times and take notes just to retain all of this amazing knowledge that you have so me too i'm gonna do that too i'm gonna take notes because um you know i'm gonna i'm gonna confess something um i enjoy very much doing this and especially doing it in a way that i i I don't have a script like i mentioned in the previous episode and all that but sometimes i i have to confess sometimes i just i don't make up things as i go but things arise as i go Mm -hmm. and i just tell you guys about them so um they're also very good for me to process everything that i study about all the all the data that i have in my brain clearly clearly everybody has noticed that Mm -hmm. and uh presented in a way that makes sense which has been the struggle of my life making sense um so it's it's very good practice for me to come here and, and talk to you about it. Um, but you got me worried there for a few seconds there in this episode with, with your faces. I was like, is this too far off? Uh, <laughs> I love your episodes. They're my favorite. I just, oh, I, you, you just give us such a new perspective on Tudor court with the knowledge that you have of art and on the Spanish monarchy. And of course, especially Catherine of Aragon, Mm -hmm. And Mary, that I think that's why the listeners and viewers are drawn to the episodes with you, because it gives us a look at part of history that we don't hear enough about. And I'm just so glad that you're available to share that with not only me privately, but with the world. Well, uh, I love this Um, and doing what you love. It it shows off and, and, you know, it's 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 a pleasure for me to to do this because. Researching, as you know, uh, it can be lonely, too. Um, And sometimes just saying these things that you've been thinking for a long time aloud just helps you to to realize how much sense they really make, at least to you. Mm -hmm. Um, And you hope that you can convey that in a way that also they make sense to other people. To really, bottom line of this, and I think I was thinking about this this morning, Uh, Maybe this could be my final thought. Um, To me, why this work that I do is important is because it shows that places like Spain and England that have been traditional, traditionally rivals, right, uh, over the course of history, weren't always rivals, were allies. And when they were allies, amazing things happened. Um, And especially, I think it's through the work that I do with, especially with with what women did. Women were peacemakers, were the ones to educate the new generation, were the ones to try to, the marketing mothers, right? We talked about the marketing mothers. So I like the marketing mothers of the 16th century because they were so educated, like Catherine of Aragon was. She was far more educated than I ever will be. that's for sure. Uh, I don't speak Latin to start with. Um, I should. So maybe that's that's on my bucket list for next year. Uh, but what I'm saying with this is that these women um, did their best to try to make the world a better place. Um, and people like uh, Torrellano, Susanna Hornboot were, were people who, who produced things to to help them do that. It was their mission to to be good queens, good rulers. That was that was what uh, Catherine Aragon really wanted to be a good queen of England, and I think she was remembered as that. She was a, thought of as that during her lifetime. I think my job now is that she's thought about that that way in her afterlife. You know, 
Um, so that's, that's what I want my work to be and, and to do. Well, you are on your way there because, uh, yeah, you're on your way because I feel like everybody is beginning to understand Catherine so much better now because of the work that you're doing and because of all the work that you're doing in art history. So Dr. Emma, thank you so much for coming on the show again. I'm sure you'll be back soon. You think so? (laughs) Yes, probably will be. Yes. Well, you know, and, and, and because we have this close interaction with people, you know, you guys are welcome also to, if this is the good thing about uh common mindset, right? Maybe you guys can can offer us some information that you want us to talk about because these snippets bring up such wonderful stories, don't they? They do. And it was so much fun today to learn about Susanna Horenboot. So. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Have a great day, guys. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. If you love the show and would like to show your support, please head on over to my Patreon page. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty for more information. Over there, you're going to find commercial free 